uh, case studies for IPM implementation. Uh, and our first presentation is going to be a, a, a joint um, presentation again by Sam Cook and Patricia Ortogo Ramos. Um, and they're going to be talking to us about cabbage stem flea beetle, um, a case study for IPM. So just in terms of, um, of what they'll be covering, and I'm sorry, a little bit of background on them. So uh, Dr. Sam Cook is an invertebrate behavioural ecologist working to develop integrated uh, pest management strategies at Rothamsted Research UK. The aim of Dr. Cook's research is to reduce insecticide use in arable systems, in particular oilseed rape. The main research areas are developing push-pull systems based on attractant and repellent natural signaling compounds, semiochemicals, to manipulate pest and natural uh, enemy behaviour for improved crop protection. Uh, the second one is understanding how agroecological -eco methods, especially those based on plant diversification, so for instance trap cropping, under sowing, flower rich field strips can be optimised to reduce pest pressure and support biological control by natural enemies of crops, of crop pests, sorry. And thirdly, uh, gaining an improved understanding of the natural enemies of crop pests and quantifying their effects. She is an inaugural member of the BCPC Pest and Beneficial Group, member of the Crop Protection Committee for, G for the GCIRC, and the convener of the entomological entomology sex subsection of the IODC Working Group, Integrated Control of Oilseed Crops. She's also an associate editor of the Journal of Pest Management uh, Science. So uh, Dr. Patricia Ortega Ramos is a postdoctoral research scientist at Rothamsted Research UK, working on reducing the impact of cabbage stem flea beetle um, by breeding uh, resistant cultivars of oilseed rape. During her PhD, she studied the management and environmental factors affecting cabbage stem flea beetle population uh, changes in the UK, as well as their effect on uh, cabbage stem flea beetle migration movements. Uh, she also studied the ecology, distribution and parasitism rates for both uh, cabbage stem flea beetle adult and larval parasitoids in the UK. The main research interest is understanding the ecological processes and interactions between pests and natural enemies, as well as the understanding, um, as well as the understanding the effects of agricultural practices on them. She wants to use that knowledge to develop agroecological approaches for pest control, for example, the enhancement of beneficial insects or the development of integrated pest management tools. So without further ado, over to Sam and Patricia. Hey, thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for um, inviting us to speak today. Can I just check that you can see um, my screen and it's- Yeah, that's, that's perfect, Sam. Okay, great. Well, okay, yes, as, as advertised, we're going to, uh, it's a double act, myself and Patricia Ortega-Ramos are going to give a double act on how IPM um, management strategies for cabbage stem flea beetle are being implemented. Okay. Sorry, my computer's really slow. Right, okay. So with cabbage stone flea beetle, I like to say you get two pests for the price of one. Um, both the adults and the larvae are, are pests of the oilseed rape crop. So the adults feed on the um, leaves of the plant as they come through um, shortly after establishment and can threaten establishment. And the larvae, um, they lay the eggs in the, in the soil. The larvae then burrow into the plant and mine the stems and the petioles and that weakens the plant, damages the growing point. I don't know if you can see there, but those buds basically are going to fall off. The whole of the top of the plant is going to fall off. This causes um, compensatory sprouting, but reduced yield. Um, and also can um, produces um, increased susceptibility to disease um, of the crop. Um, these pests have been very well controlled in the past by seed treatments, which helps to control the adult flea beetle damage at threshold um, at establishment and pyrethroid insecticides to control the larvae. However, in 2013, after the ban of the neonicotinoid seed treatments um, on all seeds and other crops that are attractive to bees, um, we had a lot of blank fields with just bare soil and no oilseed rape plants. So here's um, one of my trials and on the left there's one of Alan Dewar's trials. Um, yeah, our farmers faced um, the big problems and the neonicotinoid ban really hit farmers hard. This was particularly because at the same time as the ban, the 
the beetle had developed, started to develop resistance to pyrethroids, which were basically the only insecticide available left to, to control them after the ban. You can see there in the, in the, in the map that initially um, resistance started in the southeast of England, um, but work by Caitlin Willis at Rothamsted has now shown that that resistance has spread throughout the, the UK and is reaching you know, up to 80% of the populations are now resistant to pyrethroids um, at the current time. So huge potential of the adult feeding. But in the past, you know, it has been the larvae that, that, that do the problem, but now it's definitely the adult which is the problem. And we've we've kind of put two and two together really and kind of come to the conclusion that, that, that cabbage stem flea beetle and contradictory EU policies have been responsible for the massive decline in inulcid rate cropping that we see now. Um, let's have a look at this map, um, the graph, which shows the area of inulcid rape um, that has been sown um, through time. Farmers started growing the crop in the 1970s, but it didn't become really prevalent um, until the 1980s. Um, and growing its acreage um, steadily through time. In 20, 2003, which is the first highlighted um, dot on the map, um, partly in response to climate change awareness, the EU brought in a policy to decrease um, the fossil fuel use by increasing biofuels. And they set a target of around 2% use of biofuels in transport. Um, the taxation on the biofuels was also um, reduced um, and this created um, a big market to support um, these targets. Um, and this policy then and the increase led to a really sharp increase um, in the acreage of all seed rate grown due to this increased demand. Um, and this started to provide a big resource for the pests of all seed rape, including the cabbage stone flea beetle. So if you look at 2009, which is the second highlighted um, area of the graph, um, the renewable energies policy came into force, which increased the biofuel use target to around 20% of all energy use and with 10% target for use in transport. And again, this further increased the demand for rapeseed oil and the acreage grown because it is a very, very valuable crop. Um, at this point, our seed rape changed from being simply a useful break crop to being a very valuable crop which is grown um, in its own right. Um, the rotation shortened, which decreased the diversification of, of arable landscapes. Um, and yeah, really, really, again, increased the, the, the opportunities for all the pests of the crop to proliferate. But at the same time, in 2009, um, the Sustainable Use Directive came into force um, and this reduced the availability of many active ingredients that were available to crops um, at the time um, and um, really started to push IPM, Strategy Integrated Pest Management Strategies, um, saying it was a good thing, everybody should use them and all the government should take up a national action plan to make sure that farmers are, are using IPM in practice. But these weren't enforced and in most countries including the, the UK the National Action Plan was voluntary and in reality um, IPM was not um, introduced and it wasn't supported and research and development wasn't supported. So come 2013 which is the final um, highlighted graph um, point on the graph um, when the EU banned neonicotinoid C treatments on crops that were attractive to bees because of very real and grave concerns about bee health, um, we have a massive, massive population of pests um, and basically no other alternatives to, to control them. Hence all the blank fields that we saw um, in the previous slides. Um, and, and also increased resistance to the only available product used to control the flea beetle and massive um, blank fields, farmers start to really struggle to control a pest in the crop. It becomes very risky to grow it and they're now starting to, to stop growing the crop and it's disappearing from, from our landscapes at a very fast rate. You can see our end point now in 2019. Um, these are the levels that we really haven't seen in our fields since you know, it's 20 years ago. And we've now found you know, basically a 46% decrease um, since the peak in all seed rate production around 2010, 2011. And this has led to 
the need for imports. Some of these imports are from countries such as the Ukraine, which allows neonicotinoid seed treatments, which is creates an unlevel playing field for, for, for farmers, which is very unfair. But it's also in um, producing the need to import other fuels such as um, um, and palm oil, which is a fueling deforestation in other parts of the country. So we're really, really in, in a completely unsustainable place um, because of these um, unforeseen consequences, probably of, of well-meaning policies. But IPM is the answer. I do strongly believe that um, and that we can get there with proper IPM strategies. So what is IPM? We've already had um, some nice definitions. So I'm just going to skip to the four usual steps that we find in EU programmes. So first of all, we set an action threshold above which we must control our pest. Otherwise, we, we suffer a yield consequence. The second step is to monitor the pest density and to assess the risk of achieving that, that action threshold. Um, the third step is to do all you can to prevent the problem in the first place. Maybe this should be the first step. <laughs> um, the, these preventative methods include cultural methods, the use of semiochemicals um, and pheromones and habitat diversification. And finally, if you exceed this um, action threshold level, then you must take action and control the pests. But this should be done in a way that the, the least environmentally harmful um, methods are used first. These could include mechanical methods, inundative biological control, or conservation biocontrol with the use of synthetic pesticides as a last resort. So actually we can have IPM strategies that are based purely on synthetic pesticides. You can set a threat action threshold, you can monitor your pest, when they exceed it, you can spray. That technically is IPM and I think we need to, to talk about real IPM or, or next generation IPM in which we really do include that very, very vital third point, which is prevention. It needs to be a full IPM program to count, um, in, in my opinion. Um, and just to say that these, um, these um, I'm going to be going through each one of these steps um, and letting, letting you all know what we've actually got in terms of IPM for cabbage stem flea beetle. And we've actually published um, a review of, of the options available to farmers um, in Global Change Biology Bioenergy um, Journal. So action thresholds, they, we have them, they are available. 25% um, of the leaf area eaten for adults and five larvae per plant for, for the larvae. Um, but these thresholds have been based and formulated on responses to insecticides. So we spray an insecticide, what your response do we get? Okay, that's where the, the threshold is. Now we don't have these <laughs> insecticides and they, I believe that the um, action thresholds need to be based on the physiological tolerance of the plant. So my student Duncan Coston, who's now um, Dr. Coston and working at ADAS, did some really nice experiments where he tested the all seed rate response to leaf area injury and infestation with cabbage stem flea beetle. And he very carefully controlled the damage. So he simulated leaf area injury from adults by using a leather hole punch at various levels, including the control threshold. And in the second year, he combined this with simulated larval infection and he artificially infested plants with 0, 1, 5 or 25 um, larvae per plant. Then he placed them outside but in controlled environments and took them through to yield. And he found that high leaf area injury, up to 90% of the cotyledon removal did, or, or the young plant removal, this was at the two to three leaf stage, did not um, impact the productivity of all seed rape, which was, was quite a surprise. And I think really we do need to understand more about, about this in the field. Um, I, I find this incredible to believe. Um, but he did see responses when 25 um, cabbage stem feed beetle larvae, but not less than five were introduced. The plants were shorter, they produced less flowers and pods, and they had lower oil content compared to the, to the other treatments. So these larvae really are big pests and they, they are damaging our, our, our yields. 
but the research does suggest that maybe five is possibly too low. Um, the, the real physiological threshold is probably somewhere between five and 25, and this needs more research. But what this research does show very clearly is that using early sowing strategies, which we're now seeing the crop being sown, you know, as early as mid-July to avoid adult damage, this lets the, um, you know, the availability of egg laying and larval and damage to, to go on for a long time. So it, this is a very dangerous strategy because it increases the problems due to larvae. What have we got for monitoring? Well, we do have monitoring tools and methods available. Um, for adults, this is 25% of the leaf area eaten and you're expected to go out and make a transect into the crop 25 metres taking a plant around every metre um, into the crop and look at it to assess the percentage leaf area eaten. The, plant, the crops are very small at this time of year and it's physically demanding and time consuming. You either have to crawl around on your hands and knees like um, Andrew is here or you have to bend down and you get a backache. Um, it's really difficult to subject to um, assess the leaf area eaten. It's very subjective um, and it's difficult to do accurately. However, there are some new tools coming available. Some there's some apps which um, automatically assess the leaf area damage. Um, we've had a look at these. They're not that accurate at the moment, but I do I know that they're going to to improve um, vastly. So um, watch this space and maybe think about using using these tools to help in this process. The other problem with this, though, is that where do you assess in the crop? And we know that the cabbage stem flea beetle is not um, nicely and evenly distributed across the field. It, it does occur in hot spots. So maybe if you, uh, you were to um, go and monitor the crop at the top left hand side of the field, you know, you might get a lower value than the bottom um, right. So, you know, what's the real answer and, and how do you know that you, you have really um, exceeded the spray for the, the spray threshold for the whole field? For larvae, again, we've got monitoring tools available and we have to count the plant, the, the larvae in the plants. Um, we have to take plant samples, bring them back to the lab, dissect them under a binocular microscope. Um, and it's actually quite, you know, technically demanding to do that and requires identification skills. So we've got the, uh, an oilseed rape cabbage and flea beetle on the left and on the right. We've got um, flea beetles, but also um, stem weevils. So it does require quite tight identification skills to, to do this accurately. You can also run yellow water traps weekly from sowing right until the end of October. And if you get a mean number of 96 adults per water trap, that um, equates to um, five larvae per plant. So that's slightly easier. But again, you need to be able to detect the difference between a cabbage stem flea beetle and all the other bugs that you'll catch in a yellow water trap. Um, however, there are, um, again, some apps that will help to uh, automatically identify these um, insects in the traps. And at Rothamsted, we are um, investigating pheromones um, and potentially will help to reduce the, the amount of, of non-target um, insects that we catch in these traps. But I'd like to tell you very briefly about some um, cool new projects that I've been involved with that might help monitoring in the future. We've been looking at the potential of optimal optical sensors for real time monitoring of pests and beneficial insects. Um, basically, uh, we're using a, a, a LIDAR or a laser beam that goes across the field. Insects fly through the beam and there's a disturbance which is detected and um, we can determine the insect um, by their characteristics of this disturbance. So we flew thousands and thousands of insects through the beam um, and half of those data sets were used to train an algorithm to, to teach the computer, this is a cabbage stem flea beetle, this is a, a phylotretta flea beetle, this is a pod midge, this is a parasitoid. And then we use the other half of the training set to, to really understand how well our algorithm was performing. And we're really pleased that we got around 80 to 95 percent accuracy when we use a neural network to identify the difference as in the in the disturbance when insects flew through the beam. So we can detect cabbage stem flea beetles and other insects as they fly through the beam. 
And when we tested this in the field, we found that the activity and the abundance of flea beetles that were detected by the sensor, so the sensor saying this is a flea beetle, they did correlate with the trap catchers that we found in the field. Um, and this was a really fun experiment to do. Obviously, coverage and flea beetles are, are active in, in the evening, so it involved a lot of, of night work, but it was fun. <laughs> Um, and our vision of the future really is that maybe we can mount these on a tractor or a drone and that we can see where the hotspots are in the field and only spray those um, hotspots where, where the density exceeds threshold or maybe where beneficial density is low. So moving on to the third point of the, um, the IPM strategy, prevention. Uh, basically, this is where we're really falling down and there are very few options available to farmers to use with confidence. The holy grail of, 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 of prevention for farmers is resistant cultivars, but there are none commercially available. There are obviously some for diseases, but, but no commercially available or seed rape um, varieties are available for any pest species in all seed rape. But at Rothamsted, we have done some studies and we have found that there's variation in feeding responses um, between genotypes. So you can see at the top here, um, looking at accessions and the origin um, network um, variety associations, we've got um, very big differences in establishment and the amount of leaf area eaten um, by flea beetles. When we tested these in controlled conditions, you can see at the graph at the bottom, so, you know, um, line number three and line, line number 19 didn't have any feeding at all, whereas other lines had, you know, feeding in all the replicates that we, um, that we ran. And we wanted to look at the relationship between the feeding damage and the uh, plant metabolites, um, sucrose and wax profiles. We were unable, unfortunately, to complete that work, but I'm really happy that um, we're able to continue that work and take it forward with uh, Rachel Wells and her group at John Innes. They've also found some interesting variations in feeding um, damage and, and damage into the plant. So we're going to look at the, the genetic basis for these differences and try to understand the mechanisms of, of why we're seeing that to, to optimize it and to get some nice and resistant cultivars for farmers to use. Another preventative method um, that's quite prevalent now is companion planting. I define this as the cultivation of different types of plants in close proximity to each other so that they benefit each other. Um, the methods include intercropping, trap cropping and under sowing. And these are actually being taken up now in practice, particularly under sowing, but the, 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 there's not really supported by a lot of scientific study and they certainly haven't been optimised. So I'm going to start with trap cropping, which I've spent a lot of my career um, investigating. I, I define trap crops as plants that are more attractive to the main crop and can be used to divert the pest pressure away from the main crop. So I found that turnip rape, um, which is brassica rapa, is a close relative of orseed rape, but it's much preferred compared to orseed rape by many of the orseed rape pests. And we showed, myself and a student showed way back in 2005 that turnip rape trap crop borders could significantly reduce the number of flea beetle larvae in all seed rape um, compared to control plots without these trap crops. That was a long time ago before the explosion of the pests that we're seeing and all the cultivars have changed since then. So Duncan um, Coston repeated these experiments um, and again showed that these turnip rape trap crop borders really worked. So you can see on the left, um, our trap crop with, you can just about see the green plants in the middle, but our uh, plot on the right there, they're completely devastated and there wasn't a plant to be found. Unfortunately, these trials were lost um, during the winter. It was a really hard winter. There were loads of beetles and they got them in the end, but it did show promise. Um, we're still going on with this. We're still trying. I've got some nice trials with commercial farmers as part of the EcoStack project. And we've got some turnip rape strips um, at RSPB site. And you can see here on this graph, the, the massive bar on the left is the number of larvae in turnip rape. So they're really, really highly attracted to that. 
but the number of beetles in the ore seed rape plants next to the turnip rape trap crops is significantly lower and this kind of increases as you move away from the crop so it really does show promise and we'd like to continue with this work um, in the future. Companion planting um, is being done by farmers now um, um, and I call them um, nurse plants because I think it does what it says on the tin. A nurse crop is a crop that's planted with another to shelter it from competition with weeds so you could extend that to pests. So basically we're planting a crop or some plants which will help to protect our crop but then go away once they've done their job so that they don't um, compete with the crop. Duncan in his PhD um, with NIAB um, tested different um, cultivars and mixtures, um, fenugreek, um, there was a, um, a mixed um, brassicas and showed that um, the mixed brassica species, that's the, the second from the left, really, really worked well. Um, However, you, you need to use a clear field variety for this strategy so that you can remove the, um, the white mustard from the, the mix. And we found that the timing of the uh, application of the clear field um, herbicides was really difficult. And we got it wrong a lot of times. So it's actually uh, a really risky strategy, but it, it works fantastically well. Um, in our EcoStack project, um, we have been extending this, so you can see on the, the left, you know, the white mustard, the green bar there, it does work, it's significantly less than the other treatments, um, number of larvae per plant, oh that's the leaf area damage, sorry. Um, but broadcast wheat, um, as in um, a volunteers, um, to simulate volunteers, worked fantastically well again. Um, we tried oats. Is it just wheat or is it other cereal? So we tried oats and, and that seemed to work fantastically well, as did bursine clover. That was also significantly um, lower damage compared to our controls. But we are seeing this you know, inconsistent results through time. So we need to really understand why we're seeing these inconsistencies and understand why we're getting the successes when we do. Is it simply because the beetles are being confused when they come into the crop? If so, is that a visual or olfactory mechanisms? Is it something to do with nutrition? There's a lot to understand about this, um, but I really have high hopes that this could be a really good preventative strategy if we learn to optimise it correctly. Lastly, there are other prevention techniques out there. Longer rotations has been shown to, to have some um, promise, and we're looking at this on the Rothenstead large scale rotation experiment. And the same with minimum tillage. I know that um, Sasha White and colleagues at AIDAS are looking at long stubble and organic matter and sheep um, chewing as well. We did our own little tiny experiment on organic matter and you can see there that um, it, when digestate was applied to the field we had significantly fewer larvae. So there are you know, some other um, preventative methods in the pipeline but a long way to go to make them real for farmers. And now I'd like to switch over to, um, to Patry um, for the control mechanisms. Thanks. Just got um, two or three minutes left, I'm afraid. Okay, thanks. So I will be quick then. Um, yeah. There we are. Can you see properly? Yeah, we can see you. Great. Um, so I'm going to talk about the what control we have for Cavistaphy beetle. Uh, there are new insecticides that show promising, well, new promising approaches like uh, the post-transcriptional post gene silencing uh, via RNAi, uh, which prevents the manufacturing of insect uh, proteins uh, leading to the death of the insect when they eat it. Uh, this uh, new approach can be used uh, via GM to create resistance varieties or can be used as a spray. Um, and due to its um, specific specificity, uh, it's not supposed to affect uh, any uh, beneficial organism in the field also. Uh, there are also some biopesticides that are being uh, shown to infect adult cavistan flibital and currently being uh, further tested for Cavistan Free uh, This work is done by Claire Horro at um, Harper Adams University. 
if you want to find more about that, you can ask her. Um, but these studies are, although promising, they are still a bit far from being used. So what we uh, currently have, I cannot, yeah, sorry, uh, is what we can currently use um, in the field is conservation uh, biological control. So basically um, helping the natural enemies that are already in the field uh, to attack Cavistian flea beetle. And the main um, natural enemies that we have are predators and uh, parasites. So in predators, we have carabid beetles, uh, which have some, like we have seen uh, that two species that are treacherous, uh, quite Bristiatus and Tersuch matidus, uh, have a um, significant spatial correlation with Cavistan flea beetle, and therefore they can, they could feed on mature larvae and also on Cavistan flea beetle eggs. However, there is no field evidence for any of these, and so, um, more research uh, is needed. And this is where uh, the EcoStack projects project comes in. Uh, in this project, they are looking uh, with camera traps and feedpoint traps to the role of predators in pest regulation and the effect of companion crops. So by using these uh, camera traps, uh, they can quantify the response of the ground beetles and actually see if they are feeding on the larvae or, or the eggs of cabbage stem flea beetle. Um, then we have the parasitoids that, as you may know, uh, there are a few parasitoids uh, described in the literature that attack cabbage and flea beetle. But for example, for the larvae, uh, some of them have shown to be misidentification of uh, other ones because it's really hard to identify uh, parasitoids uh, just by sight. Um, the main one, the main parasitoid attacking cabbage and flea beetle larvae is Tresilochus microgaster. Uh, which uh, is supposed to be uh, frequently occurring around uh, Europe and the parasitation rate uh, has been shown to be like around 8% in the UK. This was a, a work from 2005 and there are um, like five other parasitoid species that are described but we don't know anything about them and uh, the parasitoids attacking adult Cavistan flea beetle for a long time, uh, only Microtonus melanopus was described to be the main parasitoid. And a few years uh, back, Microtonus brassici appeared in our lives and in my project. Um, this parasitoid was first reared uh, at Rothenstedt in 1996. And since then, we didn't have any other record. Uh, until 2018, when they started to appear in different uh, cultures of cabbage and flea beetle uh, in the UK. Um, but other than these, we don't have uh, any more information on the parasitism rates, well, updated parasitism rates. Uh, they range where are they, what, how do they kill the cabbage and flea beetle or they have any other uh, sublethal effects rather than just killing them. So that's where I focus my PhD, well, part of my PhD on. So I studied the parasitoids attacking the, the larvae. Uh, I wanted to know what species really are in the field, other than Tersilochus microgaster. And I was comparing uh, manual dissections with DNA metabarcoding, which could help, help um, knowing what other species are there without having to learn uh, an awful lot of uh, parasitoid ID. Uh, I, I've seen that this, the maximum parasitation rate detected was uh, 33%. And the only parasitoid detected to the moment, because there are still a few samples to go through, is Tersilochus microgaster. So probably the other ones were all misidentifications or like uh, they were just seen once uh, in some fields across Europe. For the adult, the parasitoid attacking the adult, uh, we know that this parasitoid, you can see there is a difference between the female and the male. The female is orange. They lay eggs inside the beetle. Uh, these eggs develop, the larvae feed inside the beetle. And as you can see on the top picture, uh, the, when the larvae is mature enough, it exits the beetle's body through the anus. So it's impossible or really difficult to know if the, the, the beetle has died because of parasitation or natural death, because there is no other sign of Parasitization. 
um, then this parasitoid uh, varies in the soil, spina cocoon, and uh, develop into an adult again. Um, I've studied the distribution of this parasitoid across the UK. Uh, the first year was 19, uh, sorry, 2019, and the parasitization was quite low, was around 7%, and it wasn't present in all the fields I studied. By next year, 2020 and 2021, uh, this parasitization rate uh, raised quite a lot, uh, reaching uh, 36%. And it was detected in all the fields. I only tested 30 fields across the UK, but it was quite well spread. So we have here a nice uh, help to control Cabistan flea beetle. So the next question is how can we support this natural enemy um, population? We're going sort of significantly over time now. Are, we, are you fairly close to the end of your presentation? Uh, yeah, I will go through this slide and then finish there. Fabulous. So we can uh, use soil management, so both uh, adult and larval parasitoid pupate in the soil, so minimum tillage will help uh, improve their survival. Field margins, as we know, these parasitoids feed on nectar, so having a nectar source close to the field will improve the numbers. And the pesticide use, uh, all these pesticides are quite susceptible to pyrethroids, for example, but any pesticide. So, uh, if possible, only a spray when necessary. But as we have seen, um, there is no safe window to spray. For example, when you are spraying in March to control pollen beetle, you are hitting the uh, Tersilochus microgaster, the larval parasitoid of cabbage stem flea beetle. So mostly any time from March to July, if you want to control any pest, you will hit some of the beneficials. And that's it. I was going to go through the gaps we still need for IBM. But to sum up, um, just to say that we have a really um, nice opportunity with this uh, ELMS uh, policy. Uh, we are entering into a future where fewer uh, in in synthetic insecticides will be available and they will be less profitable. So IBM uh, shows up like a, the only basically um, way to control uh, pests. And that we have a real, really good opportunity to contribute to sustainable farming and the use of IPN but through these elms. But we need to incentivize and compensate uh, farmers for the adoption of IPN. That's it. Thank you for everyone that helped us in these projects. And thank you for listening. Thank you.